Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What's up, folks? This is a hugely informative, science-packed episode with Dr. Moan Surf. His specialty is in the field of neuroscience, and the work him and his team are conducting is quite literally at the razor's edge of where science is and how we are connecting technology to what the brain is capable of. This episode is full of a huge amount of information. We probably covered a 10-week course in the span of an hour or so. So definitely take your time listening to it. I have a feeling that Dr. Moan's work will be gaining some huge momentum soon and really changing the way we look at the brain. So I think you guys will really enjoy this episode. Please get to neuro-hacks.com to find more information about what Dr. Surf and his team are up to. Find us on Twitter at The Human XP. Get to our Facebook page, also at The Human XP. There's a library of content on both of those feeds that we put a massive amount of work into curating for you guys. If you guys like what we're doing, show us some love by helping cover bandwidth and server costs. You can do that by getting to the main page, thehumanxp.com slash donate. As usual, guys, this is an information-packed episode that I think you will really, truly enjoy. Thank you guys so much for listening. The human experience is diving back into hacking the brain and human performance as we speak to our guest, Mr. Moan Surf. Moan, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Thank you so much. Uh, Moan, you have such an interesting history. Uh, You grew up in Israel in the 80s, and you were recruited into the intelligence unit of the Israeli army when you were 18, right? Yes, I did. Oh, that's that's fascinating. And you, you hold a PhD in neuroscience, a master's in philosophy, and a bachelor's in physics. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, how did how did this evolve for you? How did you go from being a hacker to going into science and neuroscience and studying philosophy and, and what you're doing now? So, I was a kid of the 80s, and what's common to a lot of kids of the 80s is that we grew up with computers. Uh, when I was a young kid, computers had only a few options and you just learned how to control and navigate those few options. And then as we got more complex, so did computers. So suddenly there was one more component and we learned how to toy with that. And it got to the point when I was a teenager that we just understood computers the same way the people who designed them did as in we knew how to toy with them. And I think this meant that we could change things and, and navigate and manipulate things in the same way. So when I was a kid, it was mostly adding one more life to the game of King Kong or uh, increasing your score in Pong. But it translated in the same way to being able to also change passwords and uh, change the content of some files remotely. And when internet started becoming a thing, we already had some knowledge on how it could and should work. So it evolved with that. So hacking wasn't ever a big word that seemed too complex to understand. It just seemed like what we do. So this is how I evolved. The Israeli army uh, is maybe the kind of breeding place for a lot of technology in Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that age 18, every Israeli kid goes to the army and the ones who care about technology and computers end up often being recruited 
to do is an intelligence where you find tons of people exactly like you that cared about the same things you did as a kid and now you're together and it amplifies your skills and your interest and your abilities. Right. So after spending over three years with people like you, when you leave, it's kind of intuitive that you go and open a company that uses those skills and tries to do the same thing as a civilian and and the narrative continues pretty easily and lends itself to having multiple startup companies that are the kind of way that Israel is growing its technology infrastructures and also going to academic worlds that benefit from the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, what would, okay, so then what would be the parallels of hacking a computer and your current neuroscience research? So there are some similarities that I like to draw between hacking computers and looking at the brain. Namely, the idea of the black box holding information that you have to penetrate from the outside. So hacking a computer means you control some of the inputs that go into it and you observe the outputs and you try to use those in and out to understand the middle component, the the, the black box that's inside. You can control what inputs you send to a website, you can see what happens and you try to understand how the website was built. This is in many ways how neuroscientists also look at the brain. You do something to the person, you see what they say and what they respond to, and try to understand how their brain works. It's it's remarkable that we are doing something because the equivalent uh, of neuroscience in the brain would be that you have maybe a thermostat, something that measures temperature that you put next to the outside of a computer, Mm -hmm. and you try to use this thermostat to learn what is the internet or what is a know what is a computer code but somehow even though our tools are thermostats in the same way that thermostats look at computers for the brain we still somehow manage to learn something about the brain okay so let's i mean let's dig in what i mean what are you guys learning about the brain so i think the last decade or even the last five years have shown us so many things that challenge our understanding of ourselves that what i focus on right now mostly is looking at the internals of our character and personality and explaining what they are and lends itself to looking at people's memories, people's emotions, people's dreams, and people's decision-making process. So those are the four things that we want to understand. And ideally, what we want to do is want to see how uh, Xavier decides what to do, Mm -hmm. what memories manipulate or navigate or or influence your choice what to do, how emotions translate to a choice that is not necessarily entirely under your control, and ultimately, can we predict what you're going to do in the future before you even know about it, and then can we change that between the moment your brain knows and the moment you know? Very interesting. So, I mean, we're talking about, are we talking about predictive programming here? Are we talking about kind of influencing choice? Are we, or we're just, we're just discovering the determining factors of what, how we, we, we choose things. So I'll give you examples from both. So one example would be as simple as I suggested, a choice that's very, very trivial, like what to have for lunch. So you're about to go to a restaurant and have lunch, and the waiter asks you if you want pasta or salad. And you dig into your brain and you made a choice and you say, say pasta. And the question is, when did you make this choice? Who knew what to choose? What parameters did you use to actually make a decision? And could I, A, know before you said the word pasta that you're going to say pasta? How soon before you said it could I have known? And even more so, could I have gone into your brain and changed something that would make you say salad? Hmm. And the answer to all of those is that we can know before you know, that it's sitting in your brain, that we can know uh, sometimes seconds before you know, and even before you feel that you made the answer. Sometimes before I even asked you the question, I can already assign some probabilities to what you're going to choose later. And we can actually, if we know far enough what you're going to choose, we can change things and make you choose otherwise. And this ties to a bigger picture, which is some choices that you make are really bad for you. And after you made them, you're unhappy. So we can actually help you learn which choices you're happy with. And which ones you're not? Well, let me let me just address what you said about m- making choices. And I mean, so so is this a sort of deterministic thing that you're kind of are you are you judging the principles of free will, or are you are you simply 
uh, analyzing neural pathways out of to a point or brain waves to a point where you're able to predict what a person is going to choose based on certain things so the concept of free will has been on the table for centuries millennia mm-hmm. philosophers for decades have been asking questions about free will and while we cannot give you the answer that you look for whether or not humans have free will we can definitely challenge one concept which is the concept of the uh, real timeness of free will that is you think that you made the choice when you made the choice and we know that the choice was made maybe freely but seconds before you knew about the choice so you made the choice to take the pasta and if i asked you when you would say when i said pasta and we can go into your brain and no fractions of a second before you said pasta that it's kind of blurring there and that and that you're about to say pasta in a second interesting and then and then you mentioned the choices that are good and bad for us i mean how do so the choices that that make us happy the choices that make us sad so i mean what can we talk about that a bit so let's take simple ones uh, let's take things that actually hurt you like smoking so there's smokers out there and they say if you ask them I don't want to smoke. I wish I didn't want to, but I'm interested in that and it's rewarding and it's uh, attracting me and I just cannot stop. So this is a choice the person says I shouldn't do, but I do. And now the question is it's the same brain that says I don't want to do that and the brain that says stop doing that and do that. So the question is can we amplify the side of the brain that wants to stop at the expense of the one that wants to do and help that one win over the other? And the answer is we can. We can go there and we can essentially help you control yourself better. And that's a profound thing because control is is not a it's a phys- physiological thing. It's something that's in us and we can now manipulate things and help you get access to yourself in a better way. Yeah, it's a very profound thing. So I mean, let's let's get deeper with that. How are we how are we able to do this? I mean, what what actual technologies are we using when we discover and, and use this? So in our brain, there are mechanisms that are in charge of experiences, feeling things, uh, going through uh, thoughts and and just being exposed to them, and there are ones that are more controlling things. There are kind of feedbacks and inputs inside the brain. So if you want to simplify it as much as possible, you can think about the front part of your brain as a part of your brain that uh, is responsible for self-control and for regulation of other parts of the brain. So I'll give you an example in the world of emotions for instance, and then we can talk about the world of smoking. Mm-hmm. So emotions are something that is in our brain but we don't really have control over it it kind of happens to us like you don't say you know someone that i love is sick i think i should be sad now let's activate sadness sadness starts happening and you say okay i was sad for 10 minutes let's stop sadness and move <laughs> on and it's it's kind of happening to you and you're exposed to it 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 dawns on you as if it's something that you wanted but it's your brain making things that you are just witnessing right And the question is can we control it? Can we stop the sadness if we want to or can we uh, stop the anger if we want to or can we increase the happiness? Is is there any way for us to access those mechanisms that are in our own brain? So how come the brain that's ours isn't letting us control everything? So we know that you can actually change some things by giving them different inputs. We know that the sadness isn't coming from nowhere. It's usually based on memories and thoughts that you experience you you get inputs that feed into your brain and your brain responds by sadness so now the question is can we change the inputs or the connections or something that will make you feel less sad and the answer is yes we do it in a very crude way but uh, we are already learning how it works uh, and what we do is we basically stick electrodes if you want uh, i i'm saying it uh, as if it's metaphorically but we actually do it in a very clear way we stick electrodes in people's brain <laughs> in areas of the brain that uh, correspond or correlate nicely with emotions and feelings and then we also uh, put another electrodes in the part of the brain in the front of it that has to do with emotion regulation and we essentially tell a patient here is your emotions uh, manifested by a sound that we play to you in the room mm-hmm. we wanted to make the sound disappear doing that involves teaching yourself how to make yourself less sad even though nothing changed in the world whatever bad things made you sad are still there but try to learn how to control your sadness and the person tries various techniques 
and I can tell you a few of them that work and a few that don't work, but somehow they learn to control this sound in the room that is just a direct uh, implementation of their experience of sadness and in doing so they actually minimize their sadness and essentially they learned how to access this part of the brain that normally they just are exposed to and not controlling. Now this is an example of emotion. We do the same thing with uh, what you see that's out in the world, uh, how much you want this uh, additional cigarette and so on. Basically teaching you how to control yourself better. Wow, this is amazing. Okay, there's so, so there's so much information that I, w- I kind of want to dig into here. So um, from what I'm hearing, you, you're you conducting experiments where you put people in a room where you hook up electrodes into certain regions, regions of their brain in which they, they control, they adjust or control somehow, somehow the, what the way their brain is functioning so that they feel less sad. Am I understanding this correctly? Yes. Let's explain the technical part, which is by itself, I think, remarkable. And sure. then, and then suddenly the, the just learning to control your emotions, which is remarkable, is going to sound even less remarkable because of the magnitude of the first part. So what we do is we partner with neurosurgeons who work with patients who undergo brain surgery for clinical purposes. So imagine that you have epilepsy, uh, which means a part of your brain, a small cell or set of cells in your brain, for some reason, start speaking by themselves with no reason, and they make the entire brain go into an earthquake of speaking without any provocation, which effectively means that you lose your consciousness, you fall down, you shake, and for a while, you're not there. And it could be very risky. This is epilepsy. The solution for that, for most patients, are medications that uh, help minimize the activity in their brains in the areas that are affected by it, so they have no seizures. Small number of people don't respond well to medications, and for them, the only solution is to open their brain and find the exact part of the brain that starts the problem, starts the seizure, the focus of the onset of the seizure, and take this part out. So now the surgeons bring the patient They open their brain and they stick electrodes inside in the areas of the brain that they think are suspected to be the source of the problem. And then those wires are connected to a computer and the patient sits there awake for a period of sometimes two weeks while their brain is exposed and there's wires inside their head waiting to have a seizure. And the idea is that in the course of those two weeks that they're there, at some point, they're going to have a seizure. And because we now have electrodes inside their head, we could actually monitor the seizure as it happens and trace the parts of the brain that started the seizure Mm -hmm. and know exactly which part is responsible for it. And then after two weeks, after you had a few of those seizures and we're certain that we know what part of the brain is causing the problem, the surgeon is going to take the electrodes out. She's going to resect the part of the brain that causes the problem, close everything and send you back home seizure free. So you're going to be fixed. All of this is the clinical part that happens regularly in many places all over the globe when there's patients who have epilepsy and need to have it fixed. What we do is we piggyback on this surgery. We show up to the place and we tell the patient, you know, you're going to be here now for two weeks with open brain and electrodes inside recording your brain activity. And all you do is just wait to have a seizure, which will happen at some point, but in between there's gonna be days and days where nothing happens. Do you mind letting us ask you questions, show you movies, read you stories, talk to you about your feelings, decisions and emotions and memories and anything you can tell us (laughs) about yourself while we have electrodes in your brain so we can actually learn how the brains of humans work from the inside. So this is like hacking into a computer, but also having access to the motherboard. We have electrodes deep inside the motherboard and we see how the processing happens from the inside. And the patients are always very eager to participate. They're sitting there for days and days with us. And we conduct a series of studies on them that all ask simple questions with profound answers. So we make the person actually choose pasta or salad, but now we can see the cells in his or her brain that come to life seconds before they say pasta. And now we know she's about to say pasta in two seconds. So, so are we talking about the prefrontal prefront, cortex or what region are the, of the brain are, are we focusing on here? So based on the problem the patients have, we change our electrode locations every time. So if the 
problem uh, seems to come uh, and show itself or the source of the epilepsy seems to emerge mostly in the middle front area we'll put electrodes around this area it seems to be the case that most of the uh, times we get a certain uh, set of areas that repeat themselves because both that's often where the seizure onsets are, but also those are the areas that you can actually take out. So if the patient comes and they have a problem in the area of the brain that's gonna make them lose the ability to speak, if you take it out, even though it's the problematic area, we won't do the surgery because you cannot just take it out and have them work the same way. So only certain patients actually get to go through this procedure and those are the ones that have the epilepsy in locations that we can indeed work with. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, in your TED talk, you you talk you describe an experiment with a woman watching video clips with uh, these electrodes embedded in her brain, kind of like you're discussing now. I mean, is there any certain experiment that I mean was remarkable to you, or kind of was game changing for you that 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 was expanded your research? So, to me, the, the, there are two studies that uh, to me were the most interesting ones out of the variety of studies we ran with those patients. One is the simplest study we could have imagined, but the results were remarkable. And that was the study where we took the patient and we uh, showed her a variety of images, one after the other. So she sees a picture of President Obama, then a picture of an Apple computer, then a picture of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and just a series of pictures with no particular order or no particular content that kind of weaves them together, just random things. And while she sees those pictures, we monitor her brain until we find a cell in her brain that comes to life, becomes very active when she looks at picture number one, let's say a picture of the Eiffel Tower. So now we see picture of the Eiffel Tower in front of her eyes, cell number 50 fires. <laughs> and then we show the picture again, cell fires again. We take it out, cell stops firing. What we learned first is that if we showed this woman any picture of the Eiffel Tower or even said the word Eiffel Tower or just spread a smell that reminds her of the Eiffel Tower, the same cell fires because this cell codes the concept, the thought, the idea of the Eiffel Tower and doesn't respond to a specific picture. This is what it means for your brain to think of the Eiffel Tower. So this was already remarkable, but what I think was the most remarkable version of the studies we did was one where we told the woman, we're gonna now put in front of your eyes a picture of the Eiffel Tower. You're gonna see it now in front of your eyes. And we ask you to make the cell that codes the Eiffel Tower not work. As in, a, you're gonna see a picture, your brain is gonna know what it is, and we ask you to somehow suppress the thought inside your head such that you won't think about the thing that is in front of your eyes. It's like not thinking of the white bear, mm -hmm. only that the white bear is in front of you. And to make it easier for this woman, we basically use the electrodes that's in her brain to generate a sound in the womb that corresponds to the activity of these cells. So essentially we show this woman how much she is thinking of the white bear. So when she sees the white bear, there's a lot of sound in the womb. When she doesn't see it, there's silence. So we kind of take the cell in her brain and make it something that is visible for her. She can actually see her thoughts in action. And now we tell her, you're gonna see the white bear or the Eiffel Tower in this example, and you're gonna hear the sound, of course, that correspond to it. Try to find a way to suppress this sound, essentially to make yourself not see the Eiffel Tower in front of your eyes. And the patient finds techniques that allow her to essentially learn how to not see things that are out there. And this is remarkable as a result by itself, but to me it's more profound because it suggests that the reality that our brain experiences is filtered by our senses and we can actually teach our brain to not see things that are there or to see things that are not there with very little training. So we think of the world as there and we just get exposed to it, but now we know that the world that's out there is just a proposal and we can choose whether to see it as it is or not. I find this remarkable. So you are, you're actually on the cutting edge of, of this, this research and it's very groundbreaking. Can you, can you describe a little bit about, I mean, how do you zone in on one specific cell that is sending a signal? It's a tiring, tiring process <laughs> of showing. So we stick about 60 to 100 electrodes in a person's brain in the area where they actually have a problem that we hope to capture. So we have about 100 at best cells that we're gonna listen to. There's 
billions and billions of cells in your head. So we're looking at a fraction of what your brain can do. And then we start showing you pictures and we show you picture after picture after picture for many, many, many minutes. And we just hope that at some point, one of them is going to trigger one of those cells. And surprisingly, the yield is actually not too small. We do find every now and then a few of those hundred cells that respond to a few of those hundred pictures. And I should say that we're not just fishing in a lake with no idea what we're looking for. We kind of know uh, where the electrodes are and what this part of the brain is responsible for. So we try to target this thing. So if we put electrodes in the brain, if, if I were to simplify it, if we put electrodes in the brain, in the area of the brain that's responsible for seeing faces, we would try to show you mostly pictures of faces and not just like landmarks or objects hoping that we're going to capture one of the cells that cares about faces. If we put electrodes in the part of the brain that has to do with memories, we would ask you first what things are memorable for you, and we're going to show you things that are relevant for you. So we kind of get you to help us find things. This is what's remarkable about humans. They can tell you what they want, and you can do that. There was a Wired video where you talk about how the brain is the puppeteer and we are simply the agents. What what would what were you saying? What do you mean by by that? So, so here's uh, the meaning, and I'll even convince you that it's true for all of us. <laughs> what I mean by that is that uh, things that we do and say sometimes are brewing and happening in our brain before we choose to say them or think them. And when they come out of our mouth, we immediately own them and we say, yes, of course I wanted it. But if I could go inside your brain and change something, you would maybe say the opposite and you would still own that. So we are not really the main person that we should believe. We should believe the person inside who made the choice. So here is like translating that into something more practical. Imagine that you go tomorrow to a, a pharmacy store and you're choosing to buy a toothpaste and there are two options. There's Colgate on the left and Crest on the right and you're now making a choice. And you spend five minutes making this choice. You look at the package and you look at the price and you look at the color and the promotion and everything and in the end you say definitely Colgate and you put it in your basket and you're starting to walk uh, through the aisles towards the checkout and you made a choice. If I stopped you and I asked you why you chose Colgate, you will tell me I like the, the taste and I like the price was a bit cheaper and the package was beautiful and whatever answer you're going to give me, this would seem to you like it's your answer. Now imagine that on the way to the checkout, I snuck into your basket and replaced your toothpaste with the other one. You chose mm -hmm. Colgate, I put Crest there. Mm -hmm. You get to the checkout and somehow, miraculously, you don't notice that you bought the one you didn't want. Mm -hmm. You pay for it and you go home. And when you get home, your friend says, hey, uh, did you get the toothpaste you said you're going to buy? And you say, of course. And you look in there and there's Crest there. And the guy asks you, oh, you chose Crest. Why? The reality is that if enough time passed from the moment you made the choice to the moment you have to explain the choice, sometimes we forget metaphorically but also neurologically the choice that was made and we explain the reality that we're confronted with as if it was our choice. And you're going to start explaining why Crest is better than Colgate and why the price was better and why the packaging. You're going to tell a different story just because this is the reality that you're facing right now, not even remembering that when you had the choice, you made a different choice. So we don't want to feel like we are out of control. We want to feel like we are in control of our choices and making decisions. Absolutely. Huh. And we always intriguing. explain. So our brain, what's unique to our brain, and, and it makes sense why it's that case, is that we always come up with an answer. Whatever in reality we are experiencing right now, we give it a story. And we take the past and we take what we remember about our memories and we use that to create a narrative that explains us. And it doesn't really matter to us if the reality that we construct isn't entirely true. We might actually be mistaken, but it's still the reality that we're going to weave into our story. You don't really know how it was to be a four-year-old anymore. All you have is some residues of residues of memories that you take right now and explain your story right now as if it was the story that you were when you were a four-year-old. Okay, okay. I'm starting to get the picture here of what you guys are doing. Have you noticed a difference between people who study meditation and maybe a difference between people who have healthy minds versus unhealthy minds? So it's interesting we look at that in two angles and, and they're both interesting. So meditation is something that I don't practice myself, but 
uh, our work clearly lends itself to a altered state of consciousness. So a lot of people who care about meditation come to us and say, this reminds me of A or B, and we try to use their understanding of how it works to explain our results. And I think there's something to it. There's something to uh, having a clearer state, to being more able to focus on single thoughts, to even uh, learn how to really see the world differently. I think the people who uh, practice meditation are saying that they are able to do what we train our patients to do, which is learn to focus on some realities and not the others and see or unsee things. I think this is, this is something that ties to that. Um, Generally, I think that our work uh, looks at the one thing that's unique to humans, which is consciousness. And consciousness has various levels in our lives. It has the level uh, of alertness that we have when we wake up in the morning versus the one that we experience when we're sleeping. Different, same brain, different states of consciousness. We have the consciousness of a three-year-old, ba- three-month-old baby that's the same ba- person that you are when you're 25 but somehow your brain changes and accordingly the consciousness changes there's the consciousness that you go to when you are uh, going through meditation and other states of of uh, changes uh, there's a consciousness of you when you're drunk a consciousness of you when you're uh, under anesthesia and all of those cases are the same brain just in different states and you can be an entirely different person in your mind based on those states so what we're trying to get always is to the kernel of what is similar across all of those cases. What is really you that doesn't really change when you make a choice in the morning or in the evening, when you're sleeping or awake, when you're uh, sick or healthy, uh, under anesthesia or not. And I think this is what I'm interested in. Like, who is the real you? Who is the, the actual you? self? You're, you're looking at what is the actual self? What comprises the, the self of a human being? Yes, and, and the idea behind it, one more sentence on that, is that the, the belief and, and of we have is that if you touch this core or this kernel, because it relays its information to the other parts of the brain that then execute them and believe that they are responsible, if you come in between, you can actually change people's behavior. You can take a smoker and make them not want to smoke. You can take people and make them want to eat different things, healthier. You can make a person who set the alarm to 6 a.m., uh, who wakes up and then doesn't want to be up at 6 a.m., be more true to the person who set the alarm to 6 a.m. So, you know, the conflict in our brain when we wake up between snoozing for five more minutes or being up like we planned to, these are all manifestations of the brain. And maybe I should say one more thing, one sentence, but then you can ask me if you want more about that. We also work with uh, people who seem to be better at this self-control and able to control themselves even better. And those are typically elite athletes. So we work with elite athletes who basically get to a level that they're, say, uh, running uh, for 10 miles and then they are tired, but somehow they have this ability to keep running even though their brain says, I want to stop. And somehow most of us stop when we cannot and they continue. So we try to understand their brain and see what's unique to a person whose brain is just even more under his or her control. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's keep going with that. So what, I mean, what is the difference between someone who is an elite performer? Let's get into that human performance aspect. Fantastic. So, so, so what we seem to think, and that's a common belief among scientists right now is that there are parts of the brain that act exactly like a muscle. That is, if they get more feedback and if they get more reward that says that what they do is working, they strengthen the connections and they become better at this particular task. One of those parts is part of the brain that controls your pain and controls your endurance and controls your uh, experiences of the world. And this is, again, this part of the brain that is remarkable and it's the front of our brain and it's part of the brain that speaks backwards to emotions and to pain and to memories and and to pretty much everything that uh, our brain does without us being in control and somehow feeds information into them. So what we do is we partnered with a, a, a big kind of company that has access to athletes mm-hmm. and we brought those athletes and they're known so they're famous elite athletes we brought them to the lab and we said okay we're gonna play a little game with you so imagine an athlete say Kobe Bryant a, a remarkable basketball player that we didn't study so I can mention him easily we bring him and we say Kobe we're gonna put you on a treadmill right now and we're gonna uh, measure everything that we can measure about you your uh, blood levels your uh, hormones in, in your body uh, uh, your uh, brain activity your muscle movement everything we can measure and we ask you to walk on the treadmill and we're gonna control the speed by which you're gonna be on a treadmill 
and we're going to make it faster sometimes. We're going to change the incline. We're going to do all kinds of things to you. And we ask you one thing, no matter what, please don't stop walking or running. Just mm -hmm. don't stop until I tell you to. Mm -hmm. The guy says, sure, no problem. How long is it going to be? We tell the guy, you don't know. It's going to be maybe 10 minutes, maybe two hours. All you have to do is continue. And what we do is we intentionally increase the speed and make it pretty much impossible. So no matter how good Kobe Bryant is as an athlete, we can find a speed that will exhaust him after a few minutes of running and, and he would want to stop. Right. And then he would run for say 10 minutes at this super fast uh, speed that we set for him. And then he would say, guys, I'm really exhausted. When am I going to stop? And we say, no, no, continue. Uh, we're going to tell you when to stop. And the guy says, okay, one more mile. And then he says, guys, I'm really tired. When am I going to stop? And we say, well, uh, continue. We're going to tell you. And essentially at some point he or she breaks as in they just say enough, I'm stopping. Right. And the reality is that we actually wanted them to do that. We never intended to have them stop at all. What we wanted to do is see at what point they would break and essentially and mostly how their brain looks just before they break. And the reality is that, you know, when you and I start running, I don't know how good you are as an athlete, but let's say, let's give you the benefit of being a fantastic athlete. So you run a marathon, 26 miles, and you can do that and you're exhausted, but you can still do that. But then I tell you, actually, one more marathon. And you say, are you serious? I don't think I can do that. And I say, try. And you try five more miles and it's mile 31. Your brain is still the same brain that says run. But somehow there's a part of the brain that now says, no, I want to stop. And the same brain says, no, run. And the other one says, stop. And they are in kind of a conflict. And maybe the conflict in the beginning is managed. So the part of the brain that says run is winning. But at some point, it's going to lose. And the question is, can we see this competition in your brain? Who is really you between those two? And if we can see that, can we bring you tomorrow and say, okay, Xavier, do the same thing you did before, run. But we're going to look at your brain now, and we're going to see when you get to the point that you got to yesterday, when you were about to stop. And when you get there, we're going to play a sound or, or turn a light on or somehow indicate to you mm -hmm. that we know that you're there, that we know that you're in the moment where you're about to quit. And we just ask you now to stay for one more minute at this spot that yesterday you couldn't be in. And it doesn't matter. It might be that you yesterday you ran 31 miles and today after five miles you got to this point. But all I want is to you for you to get there and stay there a little longer. And this is actually training your self-control. It's training you to become better in controlling your pain or your endurance or your ability. And it turns out that this is possible to take any person and make them better on that, that domain. We can also find people that just start great. Kids age seven that just get to a point where they are feeling this desire to stop and they're able to stay there longer than their friends who are just stopping right away. This might be a trait that our brain starts with, but it also is a muscle that we can train. So this is where we're going right now. So so that feedback, you're finding out that that feedback uh, assists people in going further and pushing their limits further? It helps and it helps in two ways. It helps because suddenly you're not alone. Like if you, you actually get a, a feeling that someone is with you and it also helps because it feels like it's a tangible task that you can manage. So it feels that uh, one more minute is always possible. You know, if you run a, a 26 uh, mile marathon, maybe after mile 15, you're exhausted and you say, I don't think I can do it. And I don't think I can make it even to 16 miles or 17 miles. But when you somehow get to mile 26 and you're maybe half a mile from the finish line, you have this boost of power that says, oh, I can definitely get to the end because it's there and you can see it. And, and I think very few people in the world have stopped running at mile 26.1. Somehow people always finish when they get to the very end of the race. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I think that our athletes, just by getting the feedback that tells them, we know that you're feeling this, this pain, we know that you want to stop, but here it is. One more minute from this point makes them somehow stay for one more minute and and this is what you need to train this this is how muscles so are, this is, are we talking about the neuroplasticity in the brain then and we are we're we're stretching that yes so so the explanation of that so, so we all we can see right now is the kind of the brain getting to this state because we do this study not with the patients uh, but with uh, regular athletes and so we don't have electrodes inside their brain just on the surface of their scalp so we can only see kind of activity and infer from that what happens so we don't really see the level of plasticity that we want to see but what i would suggest is that this is the case that the cells that uh, are controlling the pain levels let's 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 simplify it as if the entire uh, experience of running amounts to pain that says i want to stop and another part of the brain that says continue 
somehow the feedback from uh, the controlling the pain structure uh, gets more strength and it amounts to more connections being created and more connections between those connections. So every connection is a little bit stronger and also has more power mm-hmm. to control another things, which is actually what you said, plasticity. It's just I'm trying to use a word that is uh, not neuroscientifically, but actually imagine a, a tree that has just one more root being created. Those mm-hmm. roots are actually the, the connections that the brain needs. Huh. It's, I'm absorbing all this. It's very, very I know. Intriguing. We went through like 10 different uh, domains of our work in one minute. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. You know, I, I, I'm very curious about this idea. I mean, we're talking about altered states of consciousness and uh, different brainwave states. And I mean, have you, have you tried um, using LSD on patients and or psilocybin or MDMA and kind of seeing where their brain is with these experiments? So I did not. Uh, I feel that uh, the fact that uh, we get to even access the brains of humans is already so unique and surprising that I'm not going to dare ask uh, for even more uh, uh, unique things. You don't want to push your limits any further. <laughs> but your your have. neurofeedback is is hitting that buzzer. Your brain is telling you not to go for any further. <laughs> Right, but I do know that others do that. So I have a few colleagues who do just that, and where we have a lot of knowledge is on using the same readings with animals. So I focus on, on humans because I feel that uh, what's unique to us is that we can articulate what's going on in our brain, so we can learn a lot more from an experiment on a human than on a mouse. But it's not entirely true because on a mouse you can actually do a lot more things and you can actually scan a lot more brain cells and you can actually uh, put electrodes in a variety of areas that uh, that tell you not just what happens at the end but also what process have have been involved uh, in the making of a thought so you can learn a lot more and this is done so so there are scientists who look at those altered states of consciousness it's just that we don't really know what it means to be uh, a rat that is in a different set of consciousness we're not sure that uh, that what we call a a human experience is what a rat calls a rat experience (laughs) that's very interesting okay so Simon, i want to play a little bit of devil's advocate a little bit of a thought experiment with you okay so if we if we kind of fast forward 20 years from now and you know we're we're understanding these behave the ways to kind of adjust human behavior do you think do you think there would be you know this this uh, a sort of mechanism or device that we could create which controls human behavior so that let's say in in regards to sort of an immoral behavior so let's say that um someone or something has dictated that committing a certain crime or committing a certain action is bad and wrong do you think there could ever be a device that maybe is wearable or injectable maybe a microchip that you inject into your brain where which which would prevent human beings from committing these acts in 10 20 15 five years from now so i'm thinking out loud on this talk. So, so on the one hand Controlling our brains externally is something that uh, I can reframe uh, in a way that's going to sound to you mundane, but it actually is happening all the time, and that is uh, content and communication. So when I speak to you right now, I control your brain a little bit. You choose to let me in, but I start changing your brain. I, I often give talks and someone asks me uh, my thoughts about uh, about uh, drugs. They mm-hmm. say, should I shouldn't do drugs? And I say... And, the, and the, what's behind their question is, but it changes my brain. Is it okay? And I always say that everything changes our brain. Love changes our brain. Our bad breakup changes our brain. And talking to me right now changes your brain. I make you uh, create connections. And in the same, so in that sense, people that are masters of communication are able to make you do things that you didn't want to do. They they play with your emotions. They control things. And we think that we are in control of our own brain. This is kind of the puppet and the puppeteer again. We think that we are in control. So we tell a story as if it was me listening and you speaking. But the reality is that there's a little bit of an overlap here. And I have some of me in your brain right now that I own. I I can change something in your brain and you cannot stop me. And same goes when you talk to me. So there's something about communication that actually does what you said. It just sounds less alarming. Mm -hmm. But it actually has a, a, a very clear kind of 
you know, a practical aspect to it, which is the people we spend time next to and the interactions we choose to have and the communication we choose to have and the, the surroundings we create is really important to what kind of brain we want to have. So if you want to be funny, you should be next to funny people. If you want to be interesting, you should be next to interesting people because their brains rub onto yours, not just if you say, teach me how to be funny, just by so osmosis. So you're influenced by the people around you. Exactly. So this is this is not what you wanted to hear. You, you kind of asked me about the... You I know, did, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> say uh, uh, please answer my questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so taking it to the more uh, science fiction-y, but actually potential reality, uh, controlling our brains, we have now a uh, knowledge on ability to control people's brains regardless of their resistance. And I'll give you an example for one thing, and and this could go badly. So we know right now that there are moments uh, where your brain is less guarded and is more likely to uh, be received like receiving information and responding to it uh, without you being able to stop that. And right. that's a moment where if you think about it from the point of view of a hacker, it's a moment where you turn all your securities down and you just let every hacker come in. And right. that is our sleep. When you go to bed, we essentially are not there to stop things from, from getting in. Right Now, our brain is not really listening at those moments, so it's pretty safe, the, 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 the gates are locked. But we now know that there are windows in your sleep where the brain is open. It is listening. It, it sounds that you make in the outside world actually penetrate the brain, smells penetrate the brain, tactile experience penetrates the brain. So we know that actually there are moments where the guards are down and you're listening. Mm -hmm. So now we know that there are studies uh, done in the last year and a half that show a person going to sleep and someone next to them spraying smells at the right moment. And it's hard to find this right window, but we now know how to do that. So sprays smell at the right time or whispers words into their ears at the right time. And when they wake up, they actually make a choice that they think was theirs or they actually remember something that they think they put there and it turns out that it was this other person who planted that. And that means that we can think of a world where you go to sleep and there's a device next to your head that whispers the right words or sprays the right smells in the right moment and you wake up thinking you always wanted to buy Colgate. And it turns out that it wasn't you who wanted it, it was me putting it in your brain in your sleep. This still is not, it's not science fiction because we tried that, but it's not science because we also fail as many times as we succeed. Mm -hmm. But it means that uh, I think the audience and society needs to be aware of that and kind of keep an eye because once something succeeds even once, it's just a matter of finding the tools to succeed all the time. And we know that the brain is capable of doing that. So now it's just a matter of who will find the perfect tool and the perfect thing that they can do. And this is really alarming. This means someone can you know, have you go to sleep Democrat and wake up Republican. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. This, this probably won't happen, but, you know, the level of like a Colgate and Christ must have, must, maybe will happen. So, wow. I mean, I, I feel like there's so much information that we're covering so quickly and I appreciate your ability to speak so so fast to cover it all. Uh, this was but, like a 10 weeks class that we just covered. In the yeah, last I week. know. And so, I mean... Okay, so just just to review, you know, kind of everything that we've been talking about for the last forty five minutes or so. Um, okay, so our our brains are essentially mutable. We can change we can change what our brains are doing, and we can we can change our brains both in positive and negative ways. So, in a sense, I can influence you to do something that you weren't maybe intending on doing by introducing a stimulus or something when you are in a susceptible state to influence your behavior. Am I, am I yes. on the right track here? Perfect. So, so then, I mean, what does on, on a health perspective, I mean, what, what is the research showing to help humans other than just, you know, quitting smoking, I mean, what would be the most remarkable advance that, that you could say that could happen with, with this, with the, with the studies that you're, you're doing? So I'll give you, I'll give you uh, three one-liners. So you'll get the kind of three things. So one thing we can actually uh, change your behavior in the way that we mentioned, make you stop smoking, make you eat healthier food, make you choose uh, uh, when to wake up such that you wake up in a better state, make you 
everything that we can do that uh, comes between you making a choice and we helping you make a better one tomorrow. That's version one. Another thing we can do right now is we can actually go inside your head and find sections of the brain that uh, are decaying, that are not performing as well as they did before. Imagine someone with Alzheimer whose brain uh, falls apart as they, as they, or structures of the brain are basically uh, not doing what they're supposed to do as they get older. We can now learn enough when you're, when you're young, how these parts of the brain work to the point that we can really replicate all the performance of the sections that fall apart such that we know what inputs come in, what outputs go out. And when these parts fall apart, we essentially come back into your brain and we replace those parts with a chip or a system that basically all it knows is how to look at the inputs and look at the outputs and replicate what this structure that is now not working would have done. And this is another version of fixing the brain. And the third one is actually connecting you to the world such that you will get a better understanding of the world. And this is talking about the human experience. Our human experience is limited to the things that our senses are able to uh, sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, you right now uh, see what you see in the world and you call this the world, but we know that there's a lot more things out there that are just not captured by your eye because your eye can only see certain amounts of colors and so you don't see the rays of cell phone uh, beams that go from every pocket but right. they're there right so right. we can now but your brain if if your eyes could pick that up your brain knows what to do with that so now we can think of enhancing the human experience not by taking your brain and changing it or by replacing faulty parts but by actually feeding into the existing brain more information from the world that just tells you more about what's out there making wow. the world richer experience so suddenly you will see more you will smell more you will uh, be able to to feel you know molecules of dust that are on your body that right now are below the threshold of your tactile experience you can actually say oh there's too much dust in the room because i feel it and the ultimate level that this can go to is that we don't have to just connect the world that's out there by having more senses feed into the brain, we can actually take things that have no sense to them and feed them to the brain. Here's what I mean by that. When you drive your car to work and your uh, gas is, uh, your car is running empty, you're about to have no gas, we right now turn a little light in the car that says, out of gas, go get gas. But this basically is a light that speaks to your eye, that speaks to your brain and has you interpret this light as I need to get more gas. Mm -hmm. What if you connected this car to your uh, belly <laughs> and from your belly to your brain so it will make you feel hungry mm. when your car is empty you're going to feel hungry or when uh, your stock portfolio falls down you're going <laughs> to feel pain so it basically <laughs> translates the experiences in the world into something that your brain recognizes and because we know how pain works in the brain all we need to do is take something in the world and plug it into the brain and have the brain feel the pain of the market or the uh, emptiness of the car <laughs> or, or anything that we anything that has a signal that we can uh, right now recognize with our senses just by using our cognitive aspects saying okay when this light turns on the car is empty need to get gas we can translate to a feeling that we'll know how to respond to because our brain will just feel it fascinating wow that's i mean it's it's truly mind-blowing. I mean, I, I This is the human experience that kind of we can think about when it comes to, you know, scientists call this thing human version 2.0. Basically, not just taking what Mother Nature gave us and saying, okay, we're satisfied with that. Let's make sure that this is working well. And But actually saying, okay, well, there's more things that we want. What about having uh, humans fly? Uh, bats fly. They have wings. We know how to build wings. It's just that Mother Nature didn't give us wings. What if we built wings, attach them to the body, connect them to our brain, have our brain learn how to control them, and suddenly we can fly? So all of those things, evolution will spend millions of years creating if it even is advantageous, but humans are now able to do it tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So, Moana, I, I, shifting gears a little bit here, um, and this is kind of a personal question. I, I spent a lot of time using hemispheric synchronization where, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know what this is, right? Yeah. Okay. So, do you notice that there is an improvement with with people who use hemisync to kind of have their brain hemispheres communicate? So, I, I, I don't know enough to give you the right answer. Because um, I worked almost entirely on the opposite of that, mm -hmm. which is uh, looking at people who don't have a uh, perfect synchronization. I try to think what would be. Uh... 
So, okay, so let me let me tell you what we do now and maybe we'll try to think about it. Anything has to do with uh, how the brain basically keeps time, how it synchronizes, is something that we, we spend a lot of time looking into and we know that we can uh, toy with that and break it. Mm-hmm. And we know what happens when we break that. We know that uh, we know that if I if I have you you know tap on the table uh, like a, a pattern like say p- tap every every second one tap with both your fingers you're gonna be pretty much perfectly accurate like your 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 left index finger and your right index finger are gonna tap at the same time. There's gonna be zero or almost no delay between the two fingers because your brain to begin with is perfectly synchronized and when you send the directive to the left finger and to the right finger, it happens at the same time. But if you and I sit in front of each other and try to tap one second uh, at a time the <laughs> table, we're going to be far apart <laughs> because there is no synchronicity between yours and my brain, even though we're talking and we communicate and everything. There's something that makes a brain an individual entity. But this uh, is a current state. Right now, your brain is yours, my brain is mine, and there are far apart and so and, and they're not working together even though we have a method called communication to actually kind of create some residue of me in you and you in me but one of my colleagues uh, uh, who looks at consciousness in a very profound way not just to try to explain the current state of consciousness but also the future suggests that there shouldn't be a problem actually adding a wire going straight from your brain to my brain <laughs> And if we wire it in the right place and the right time, and we actually control the bandwidth such that communication really will flow from yours, then we can have an, a hemispheric synchronization, not between your left and right hemispheres, but your right and my left. Mm. And, and it, it, it will actually not only uh, enhance our ability to communicate and to you know, really synchronize behaviors, like tapping a finger every one second, but potentially it will actually mean that some information will leak from you to me and me to you, such that we will share an experience together. Wow. And one of his theories that is right now untestable, but suggested a really uh, profound idea, is that when we would do that, if we will find a way to really plug one brain to another, but fully wired, not just like using a, you know, a reading from one and <laughs> then stimulating the other, mm-hmm. What will happen is that immediately what will emerge is a third entity that will be the sum of those two and it will think it's one. So the same way you think my left hemisphere and my right hemisphere are both me and there's only one me and those two things are just sides of my brain. It's not like the left heart, the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart th- are thinking that there's two hearts. They think, okay, we're part of a heart. Mm-hmm. The same way your brain, it thinks there's one brain and you talk about hemispheric synchronicity as if you're trying to kind of improve the connection or the communication between two sides of your own hemisphere. Right. Once we plug our two brains, the new character that will emerge will think of it self as one, and it will suddenly you know, resist the idea of putting it into pieces. It would resist the idea of actually cutting out the wire and to say, no, no, I'm, the whole is me. And if you cut the wire, it would feel as if you cut the connection between the two hemispheres. Now, this is not a speculation. We can't prove it, but all of the theory that you created suggests that this will be a reality. That that, that if you take... It's almost like a new type of consciousness then. Exactly right. He calls it a a new type of consciousness. He actually quantifies it nicely and and he speaks about what it would mean. And going back to what we said a few minutes, minutes ago, it's something that is hard to try and test in humans... But we can actually imagine doing something like that in some uh, very, very simplified version of a human, like a worm called C. elegans that has only 304 neurons. There we not only know what each of those neurons do, but we actually know how to read them and write into another C. elegans. So we can actually imagine doing something along the lines of what I just said is totally speculative and science fiction-y in the real world and see if this uh, new C. elegans that's actually made out of two thinks that it's one and suddenly has different ideas of what it means to uh, hibernate or to walk left or right or to eat food. Suddenly things are going to look different for her. Total uh, futuristic and science fiction idea, but right now we can't find any reason to also discard this idea because it makes sense from the neuroscientific perspective. 
Wow, Moana, I'm I'm truly blown away by this conversation. We t- we talked for, and it's been an hour, almost an hour, and I feel like we've covered so much information. I just, uh, I mean, it's it's no surprise that you've been given um, awards for your work and, and grants for your work, and you know, I I really I'm really curious to know you know where your work is going to be in two, three, four, five, even, you know, even a year from now where you guys are going to be. That's scheduled to talk. So since science now advances so fast and I told you about my work, but about also the work of 10 other people who all do something. I think we should uh, make it like an annual gathering where we see what <laughs> happened in the Absolutely. last year. Absolutely. I'm, I'm completely up for that. So, Simon, where can people find what you were doing? I know you're running C-Lab over there. What's the website for that? Uh, I guess I'm the easiest person to find. People always ask me, do you have a business card? And I just say, look my name and, and there's everything leads to the same place. Uh, the lab that we put is called uh, neurohack.com. Okay. Uh, so that's that's kind of combining the neuro side and the hacking side. So neuro-hacks with S in the end, dot com is where we try to put everything we do, but we're always behind. So listen to the podcast, it's easier. Okay, so neuro, neuro-hacks.com is where everyone can find you. Exactly. And um, yeah, Moan, thank you so much for you know lending us your time and, and being here. I really, really appreciate everything that you're doing and, and, and discussing it with us. Thank you, it was lovely. This is The Human Experience. We are gonna get out of here. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will see you guys next week.